I'm going to take a quick look at Robert Bennett's paper, The Geocentric Testimony of Our Tides. It is a banger. We're going to go through it a little bit real quick. Uh, let's bring up Canva here. There we go. All right, so thanks to Robert Bennett, we have this wonderful paper. We will go through the math, the proposition, and the conclusion because we all agree. So he set out to solve the problem of uh, why do high tides occur when the sun and the moon are at the both near and far side. Essentially, like, why do we have the double diurnal semi-bulge, and how does the sun and the moon both uh, interact to cause the, that bulge, as per the heliocentric model? And then he has the other issue to solve was why the moon was more than twice as important than the sun in determining local tidal ranges. Of course, in their model is 400 times bigger, but 400 times further away, so it should be having a proportionate exertion of gravitational force, you would think, right? So we go into his proposition here, and he has geostatics, right? He's trying to find, with math, the acceleration at points A and B, that would be over here, A, and over here, B, uh, with respect to the center of Earth, which is O, over here, due to the gravitational influence of the moon and the Earth, Right over here, as shown in this figure. So this is the basis for the math that we're going to go through in the next couple of slides here. Pretty much the radius of Earth, the RE, right over here, this thing. And then the distance between the Earth and the Moon, the D. So we're going to use that later on. Mass of the Earth being ME, mass of the Moon being MM. We're going to be using all of that later. So essentially, Again, we have o, o and X, like I said before, radius of the Earth, radius of the Moon, distance between the two, and we start doing some calculations. We have the acceleration at point B, opposite of the Moon, right? So at point B over here is given by A of B would be, uh, let's see, G of ME, so it's mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth squared, plus GMM, which is the mass of the uh, Moon, whoops which is the mass of the moon over the distance between the, the earth and the moon and the uh, radius of the moon squared or the radius of the earth squared, sorry. And then equals to break it down, it goes G of M of the mass of the earth over the radius of the earth squared equals the uh, gravitational force of the mass of the moon over the distance between the earth and the moon squared times one plus two times the radius of earth over the distance between the earth and the moon. That's how you read that. And over here we have the acceleration of point A facing the moon is given by. So again, it's doing the same calculation on the other side, and we'll just uh, buzz through that here. And we have this wonderful sort of conclusion. Uh, let's see if we can't move me somewhere else. How about up here? There we go. There we go. All right, that's good. So again, figuring these calculations out, he's doing you know, the acceleration at point A and the acceleration at point B. So again, the, the tidal lunar acceleration of each celestial body. And he does it by calculating it like this. So he has the A of A equals the gravitational force of the mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth squared plus gravitational force of the moon or yeah, mass of the moon over the distance between the Earth and the moon plus the radius of the Earth squared, which breaks down to a gravitational force of the mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth squared plus the gravitational mass of the Moon over the distance between the Earth and the Moon squared times 1 minus 2 times radius of the Earth over the distance between the Earth and the Moon. And of course we solve this for the A of O would be the gravitational force of the mass of the, of the Moon over the distance between the Earth and the Moon squared. That would be this point over here, A of O, right? So we're doing A of O, A of B, and A of A. So this essentially is all how you want to calculate all of these functions, right? So here is where it's a better opportunity to, to visualize where we broke it down, right? So acceleration of point A of A is this one over here, B of B is over here, right? And then A of point A. So I, he's just showing you in the diagram where we were calculating it. So continuing, we have the acceleration at point A, B with respect to O, right? So Again, the A, B with respect to O versus B, right? So it goes O or goes uh, A, B, O, which would be uh, roughly negative the gravitational force of the mass of the Earth over the radius between the Earth and the, uh, over the radius of the Earth squared plus two times the gravitational 
mass of the moon times the radius of the earth over the distance between the moon and the earth cubed, right? So that would give us roughly the same thing over here. It's almost the same formula, same calculation over here. And then we finally get to this page here when we finally have equivalated the, or if we have calculated the combined effect of the moon and the sun when they act in a straight line. So this goes back to our constructive and destructive interference. Well, along with tidal wave theory and fluid dynamics, you know, when the waves go in the same direction, they constructively interfere, increasing each other's speed and size. When they perpendicularly intercede, they go slower and they will slow each other down and bring each other to a smaller size, right? Super easy. And this is a sort of the same effect. It's talking about when the sun and the moon are orbiting and they get close together, then that is a constructive interference and they usually result in their spring or neap tides, right? But this is what it's talking about is when it's combined, when the gravitational forces are combined in the straight line, this is what the expression of the force would be, right? So it says, quantifies the acceleration difference due to the gravitational attraction of the Earth, Moon, and Sun, considering the order of magnitude of the radius of the Earth uh, between the, the, the Moon and the, and, the, and the Earth and radius of the Earth between the Moon, right? So... It calculates the difference in acceleration from the near side to the far side. This is important. If we go back to our previous slide here, we can say the difference between, yeah, so right here, from A and B and to B and A. It goes from the near side to the far side. So as it travels at from where we are to where it should be on the other side, how does it have an opposite impact on the bulge? Right? Why, why does it increase the bulge then? So we would go through this again, replacing the moon with the sun to get the same calculations, assuming the gravitational forces would be the same. Perform the same calculation with the moon replaced by the sun. You substitute the mass of the moon, m, with the mass of the sun, ms, and the earth moon distance, dd, with the earth sun distance, dd. We're just going to uh, swap some variables, do the same calculation we get the combined gravitational effect when the moon and the sun act along the same line right over here so over here rather this is where we have it and then they have the acceleration difference across the earth so essentially because the tidal forces are created by the difference in gravitational forces not the actual force itself then the difference would be the main determining factor so we have the acceleration difference across earth equals essentially the same calculation we had up there, adding those two together, right? So they calculate the, the acceleration difference from Earth's near side to the far side and to the gravitational attraction of the Earth, Moon, and Sun. So this would be the conclusion of Robert Bennett's paper. He determined the uh, ratio for the lunar acceleration to the solar acceleration of the tides. Uh, so based on only the static forces of, gravi of gravity above, then we can conclude that in uh, in these kind of units, which you can calculate it out here, we finally get, including you know the mass, supposed mass of the Earth and the Moon. Again, mass of the Moon based on optics and uh, 0 0.53 degrees being covariantly scaled for varying distances and diameters that all work as factorials. But if we convert it back to MKS units, we finally get the uh, total uh, ratio of lunar to so solar tidal acceleration as 2.35. So I mean that the moon acts 2.35 times more than that of the sun, no matter where they are. This essentially would be that, you know, if the earth and the, I mean, if the, the sun and the moon are each causing equal effects on the tides, then they, then you'd get diurnal equal uh, semi-diurnal budget bulges and hula hooping all the way through. But you wouldn't get that if the moon was 2.35 times stronger than the sun. That wouldn't work, right? This also shows that you know, the tides vary by a factor of 2.7 times depending on the moon and the sun. Meaning, if the sun was over here, you might get 270% less tides as opposed to the moon being the main gravitational force. That's crazy. That's a crazy amount. Here we just have the uh, math. We're going to write a summary slide here, just rounding it up. Those would be... You know, variables, the constants, the things we had before. And, of course, from the other values already determined of the lunar acceleration, we have a physics form at 2.16, NOAA 2.15, hyperphysics 2.27, Wiki had it at 2.22, 
and essentially it was average at 2.27. So this was just a double check to make sure we were in the ballpark, and we absolutely were. It was absolutely on point. So conclusions, right? The moon's acceleration of the tidal water is more than twice that of the sun of the new moon alignments. Now, remember, the new moon is when the moon is not there. This is the least luminous phase, and it's when it's next to the sun. So it should be a constructive interference with the sun and the moon since they're both acting in the same way, right? It's not how it works, though. And it's the geostatic prediction is consistent in our cosmic model where the Earth is stationary. Only gravitational forces produce the tides. What does that mean? Well, remember when they had to have centrifugal acceleration balancing out gravitational acceleration? Indeed, that's not even happening. The moon causes no centrifugal acceleration on the Earth tides because the Earth doesn't orbit the moon. Duh. Mathematically proven that there's no, uh, there's no centrifugal acceleration needed in this math just using the gravitational force of the moon and the proximity. Crazy, right? So the sun uh, has actually causes a centrifugal acceleration on the Earth in the consensus of the heliocentric model, or it would have to if it was orbiting the sun, right? Or if we were orbiting the sun, or if the sun was orbiting us, it would be a little bit different, right? So how the centrifugal force varies depending on the sun. I'm just going to use these, the relative uh, is the Earth's orbital speed around the sun, incorporating the average speed of 30 kilometers a second, and then adjusting for the ecliptical path for speeding and accelerating and slowing down, right? And we have some math to figure out for the uh, centrifugal force the sun would be on the far side, and then on the near side, so the far side, and this answer on the near side, and averaging in the center, we get about this much. So when we compare this, right? We, we essentially determine that because of the ratio of the centrifugal to gravitational acceleration of the sun is 11,764 times stronger. What the hell is that? The centrifugal force due to the sun's influence is 11,764 times greater than its gravitational acceleration. How in the world would that be? What? What? 1200 times larger if this was true tides would be a thousand times higher and it would be heat absolutely insane but what we just showed you is we already accounted for the correct tidal ranges using gravitational forces so what can we conclude right since gravity alone acts accounts for the observation of the double tides on opposite sides of the earth with a different range of lunar and solar tides right so we only have the gravitational force that we calculated totally works out 100% doesn't need centrifugal acceleration. That's a problem, right? So static gravity alone accounts for the double tides. Then the first conclusion is that centrifugal acceleration does not exist either, or it's zero. The second conclusion is that the Earth does not orbit. We are stationary, in which case all of this math would make perfect sense. When the centrifugal acceleration of Earth's orbital speed is added to the gravitational acceleration, the heliocentric theory comes up as bullshit, people. Essentially nonsense. There is no evidence of centrifugal acceleration or force in the tidal behavior at all. So, again, concluding with Mr. Bennett here, we've concluded that this coincides with other geocentric tests performed, including Newton's bucket, Sagnet's rotor, uh, Bennett's hiker, and Wang's linear Sagnet interferometer, all supporting an immobile, not fixed, stationary Earth. So conversely, there are no proofs by testing the scientific model or realistic interpretation of the test of the Earth orbiting the Sun. No centrifugal acceleration found, no supposed forces interacting, nothing of the sort. So the rise and the fall of the tides around the world and the, and the toroidal breeding in and out is a semi-diurnal repetitive demonstration of Earth's central position in the world. Man, absolutely. Could not set it better myself. Thanks to Robert Bennett for his wonderful paper.